This is me. The navigator is my poor father who right about now is surely regretting ever teaching me how to drive. The car is my 993 Audi Avant, one of only a handful ever imported in Canada. And while it started as an 80 horsepower front wheel drive family hauler, it was a fully built 400 horsepower quattro cage replica of an Audi RS2 by the time I drove it off the road. The ditch we've just landed in is located on a tiny island off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, some 2,500 kilometers away from my home in Ottawa. The race is Targa, Newfoundland. But this isn't the race. This is a practice stage before the race even started. That's right, I drove the most expensive car I've ever built into a 10-foot ditch before the race even started. My little off-road adventure caused thousands of dollars in damage and nearly destroyed any chance we even had of starting the race. But with hard work, a few sleepless nights, and a lot of support, my dad and I were able to pull off nothing short of a miracle and drive this car across the finish line at Target Newfoundland in 2011. Now that was almost 13 years ago, but since this Audi is in fact the reason I started this channel, and since just a few months ago I celebrated my 100th episode, I decided it's finally time to dig up my favorite build from under all of the dust he's been collecting for the last 12 years and finish it to its deserved glory. So if you like old school Audis and you want to see me rebuild this very unique B4 powered by the legendary turbocharged 5 cylinder Audi engine, don't forget to click the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the upcoming Project Targa episodes. But before all of that, in today's episode we have to fix this very beautiful yet very sick 2017 Audi Q7 with the Audi 3 liter V6 supercharged engine. Same engine found in the S4, SQ5, A6 and a multitude of other Audi models. Now, a little less than a year ago, I was able to cure my sister's Audi Q5 with a two liter turbo engine, which was burning a tremendous amount of oil. It was going through about a liter every 500 kilometers or so. And the only thing that really worked for that and my A4, which is basically facing the exact same issues, was uh, a piston soak. I used Berryman's B12, soaked the pistons for about 24 hours which was able to resolve the oil burning issues for both of these cars. The Q5 is now sitting at 12,000 kilometers after the piston soak, which means it is due for its second oil change. At 7,000 kilometers since the first oil change, it has not gone through its first liter of oil, which means that the consumption is actually improving as the car is driving along. But I will keep an eye on it on a longer term. Since the Q5, I also did a piston soak on my T3 Touareg with the 3.6 liter VR6 motor which was burning one liter every 2,000 kilometers, and it's now gone through one liter to every 6,000 kilometers. So quite an improvement considering these guys really shouldn't be burning any oil. Since the third episode was released when I asked a bunch of your questions, um, I keep getting comments on, on, on all three of the videos with questions about how we can possibly go about doing the piston soak on various different engines. Seems like a lot of other car manufacturers are suffering from the same issue. I've had questions about Volvos, had questions about Subarus, Toyota, Honda, and all that sort of stuff. Now, I myself don't have a lot of experience with other brands, but if your oil consumption issues are caused by stuck piston rings, piston soak will likely solve your issues. A very common question that I've seen come up is whether this will work on the Audi 3 liter supercharged V6 motor. Just like the two liter turbo of the same sort of generation, this motor suffers from oil burning issues all over the place. So folks are having this problem all over the world, North America, Europe, all that kind of stuff. And I keep getting people asking me the question whether this is gonna work on this motor. Now, as a result, since last year, I've been looking to buy a uh, oil burning three liter supercharger, whether it's S4, Q7, doesn't really matter, uh, but haven't been successful until a local viewer uh, contacted me with a very severe oil consumption issue on this particular car. The car behind me is sitting at 180,000 kilometers and is currently going through one liter of oil every two to 400 kilometers, depending on the driving style. So as the owner said, if he's a little bit more spirited and his foot is on the gas, the car will go through one liter of oil every 200, 250 kilometers. That's pretty bad. We've already done the math on, on what this means. That means that you're spending four liters every thousand kilometers, or if you were doing a 5,000 kilometer uh, oil change, you're doing 20 liters of oil every oil change. That is absolutely insane. So that's, that's not a realistic thing. The interesting thing is, aside from the oil burning, this engine is running perfectly fine. There's no misfires, there's no other issues with it, but it is killing a mountain of oil every time you run it. Now, the owner has already done what all of us have done before, which is take it to a couple of shops, talk to the dealership, and see what their opinion on this is. The answer to the oil burning question when it comes to any other shop out there is usually about the same. The engine needs to be rebuilt. There's no other way about it. 
Nobody will try anything else. Very few shops will actually try to do, you know, a piston soak or whatever it is. So most of the shops you ever go to are going to give you the same story back and forth, regardless of what the engine is actually doing. They want to replace it or rebuild it. The owner of this particular vehicle received a couple of quotes. And frank <laughs> frankly, the first one seems a little bit insane because he was quoted $23,000 to get the engine replaced on this car. And we're not talking new engine here. We're talking about a used engine with similar mileage, one year warranty and labor. So we're talking about $23,000. Now mind you, that's Canadian, but $23,000 to get the same engine in the same car that could potentially have the same issues down the road. Okay, that's nuts. That quote is comprised of $18,000 for a new engine and something like $4,000 in labor. I have no idea how you get $18,000 for a new engine, but that's beyond the point. I checked on Facebook Marketplace and I can actually find the same car with lower mileage for less money. The whole car with the engine for less money. So $23,000 is absolutely insane. And while the second shop gave him a lower quote, it was still not pleasant. Like I think the lower quote was in something in the ten dollars to $15,000, out of which $12,000 for the engine and another three dollars $4,000 for the labor. Needless to say, the owner was not very ecstatic about this, not to mention, I don't think he actually has the money to, to spend $23,000. Nor would anybody in their right mind spend $23,000 to try and replace this engine. So just like all of us in this situation, he accepted the reality that he's gonna to continue to put a liter of oil in his engine every week until he more or less sells the car. In his research, this viewer actually found the Q5 video. And just like all of us watching this right now, he thought that this may actually work on his motor as well. Com Completely randomly, it turns out that we're in the same Facebook group for my local Audi Volkswagen Club. And when he was asking about the soak, I kind of reached out and said, hey, I've done this before. Uh, you know, is there anything I can help out with? We got to talking, realized that he's actually watched the video. He wants to do the process that I've already done on the Q5, but he wants to do it on the Q7. Since I was already looking for the same car to buy, I figured, you know, might as well save myself $20,000 in buying a car. Why don't I just go ahead and do it on this car and we can see what happens. What we're doing is we're trying to solve the oil burning on this Q7 with the three liter V6 supercharged engine. However, there's a slight caveat here. This is not my car. I don't own a garage. I have no liability. And the owner at the same time doesn't have a spare vehicle. In other words, doing this how I would normally do it if this was my car is perhaps a little bit outside of the risk tolerance for the owner of the vehicle. So after we talked a bit, what we decided to do is try and solve this problem in sort of a phased approach, which actually works great for him and works great for me and I'll explain. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with a very, 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 very mild version of the B12 piston soak. What I'm talking about is we're gonna do a piston soak with seafoam. The difference between seafoam and B12 is quite significant when it comes to what we're trying to do. B12 is a solvent, um, Seafoam is actually an engine treatment. It's more of a lubricant with some solvents in it. So Seafoam is quite a bit weaker than B12 when it comes to that. But because Seafoam is actually designed to be run inside the motor, as an engine flush, for example, the risk of any actual failure is negligible. So what we decided to do is actually start off with Seafoam. And since I've already done Seafoam soaks on my two reg and I did it on my A4 and they were actually successful, we figured that if this shows an improvement, we can then move on to something stronger uh, if we need to. Right, so if, if, if B12 is actually required, if we don't end up solving this problem with seafoam, which we probably won't, um, we'll move on to um, B12 and do it that way. Also doing this process over a couple of different phases allows us to catch some of the issues that I suspect we're gonna have and try and resolve them as we go along. So that's the plan for today. Let's go see if we can fix this supercharged engine. So the interesting thing is only one out of six plugs actually looks decent. The rest of them are all wet looking. 
And I know this camera doesn't really focus very close up, so I'm not gonna try and get it in, but these are new plugs. These have been replaced very recently, actually, and you can see the amount of buildup on the front of the plug. This was uh, very similar to the Q5 that I did. Obviously, Q5 was way worse, but for new plugs, these do not look very good at all. And for comparison, there's a sort of clean one that I have. You can see a ton of buildup on number six here. I took a look inside the cylinders. I can't really see anything that will prevent me from doing this treatment. We check the compression, all six cylinders seem pretty healthy. On a four cylinder straight engine, this would be a fairly straightforward process as you guys saw on the Q5. However, this is a V6. So we've got six cylinders and they're sitting at an angle of 90 degrees to each other. So about 45 degrees um, off the vertical, which means that as I pour the liquid down, it's not, if you can picture, the piston is sitting sideways, the liquid is not gonna cover the whole piston. So the soak would not be as effective as it would be on a straight uh, engine. And as you can imagine on a boxer engine, a lot of uh, folks have asked about their Subarus, it would be nearly impossible to actually soak a piston because the pistons are sideways. So whatever you pour down the uh, actual cylinder is not really gonna stay with the piston. Now I was trying to do some math to figure out the best way to divide this. At the moment, the uh, low oil warning light came up on the dash, which means the engine is exactly one liter of oil lower than it's supposed to be. So ideally, we would add about a liter. Unfortunately, that's not a whole lot of liquid to go around the piston. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a little bit over that. Um, I've got myself three cans of sea foam here. They're 473 milliliters each. So about one and a half liters between the three of them divided by six uh, cylinders, we get about half a can or about 230 milliliters per cylinder for the first run of the treatment. We're gonna start off mild sea foam, 230 milliliters per cylinder for the first 24 hours. Then we're gonna run the motor with one and a half liters of sea foam diluted into seven liters of oil. So we're gonna be a little bit strong on the sea foam, but not as bad as the B12, all right? Now, I don't nearly have enough liquid to be doing this uh, every six hours. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide the 230 milliliters into two uh, sort of pours. I'm gonna do one now. I'm gonna let it sit for about 12 hours. I'm gonna rotate the crank by hand and I'm gonna pour the second um, amount of liquid and let it sit for another 12 hours rotating the crank by hand, okay? So it's a little bit different than what I did with the Q5. Honestly, it's just a matter of math. You can do it any way you want if you wanna do, you know, half or like um, 50, 60 milliliters every six hours. That's up to you. I think for this first run, uh, we should be okay with just two pours with rotating of the crank um, for a total of 24 hours. Okay, pretty straightforward. Let's pour the liquid in and let it cook for 12 hours. Here we go. That's about 100, 115 milliliters going straight into cylinder one. And we repeat for all the rest. All right, that's 150 milliliters per cylinder. A few of the pistons are almost at the top, which means that the liquid is actually coming to the spark plug hole, which is actually a good thing because that means that we actually have liquid on the entire surface of the piston. In fact, for the second run, I'll probably, what I'll probably end up doing is doing them one cylinder per time and putting the cylinder at the top before filling them out and letting them soak. Let's close the hose just to limit the evaporation. And we're gonna let this cook for 12 hours. All right, we're a little over 12 hours in. Let's take a look at the cylinders. Okay, cylinder number one, liquid is still inside. I don't know if you guys can see that on the camera. 
the liquid has actually not moved at all. Number two is empty. Number three, full of liquid. Number four is dry. Number five has a little bit of liquid left in it. And number six is completely dry. Nothing really unexpected. We've seen this before uh, on a couple of cards that I have personally done and a lot of viewers have confirmed the same thing. It seems to be pretty random which uh, cylinder lets the soaking in. And on the second time around, it changes. So this doesn't really tell us anything, the fact that there's liquid still left on top. So what I'm gonna do now is rotate the crank as much as I can, and then we're gonna pour the rest of the sea foam down into each cylinder. From the bottom, we've got a much better view of the crank pulley right there. So I'm gonna to have to turn that to turn in the crankshaft. A lot of you folks ask the exact same question, how many times do I have to turn the crank? You know, can I do it too much, too little? Can I use a starter? So um, pretty simple answer to that. Turn it as long as you want until you get bored. There's nothing negative about this. If you want to keep turning it for the next half an hour, that's perfectly fine. All you're doing is helping the liquid sort of get in between the rings better. As for using the starter, do not do that. I barely turned the crank for a second and pushed all of the liquid that I had in one of the pistons um, completely out and onto the floor. So if you hit the starter to rotate the crank, all you're gonna do is just push all of the liquid, anything that's left over out of the engine. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep the liquid inside, just turn the piston slowly so the liquid can try and go in. This is our second pour, 150 milliliters of sea foam for each cylinder. And we're gonna leave it for another 12 hours before we close this up, start the engine, do the engine flush, change the oil, and finish the process. All right, we're 24 hours in after the second pour of the liquid. All six cylinders have liquid steel inside of them. Now, this is a little bit different than what I saw on the Q5. In the Q5, all of the liquid would end up draining down uh, fairly quickly. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we can't really judge either way. The point is the liquid has been sitting on the pistons for quite a while. Obviously, I cannot drive with this the way it is and I can gotta close it up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna suck out the remaining sea foam, clean out the cylinders, uh, hit the starter to blow everything out, and then we're gonna close it up and go for a drive. That should have cleaned up the cylinders pretty good. Spark plugs are going back in. Once again, I'm gonna rotate it by hand just to make sure that everything's fine once we have compression. And then we're gonna try and start the engine. That's the first one. Usually the smoke is outside of the garage. This time around, you can't really see anything inside. Oh my God. The oil is nice and warm. It's got sea foam in it. Let's grab a quick sample as we're draining it out. And then we're gonna take the filter out. This oil actually has fairly low mileage on it. As you can tell, it's pretty clean. I don't really see any grit in it. Certainly none of the stuff that we were seeing with the Q5. It's very, very thin, obviously, because of the sea foam in it, but otherwise 
yeah, this oil has very low mileage on it. It was changed recently actually by the previous owner, so it's a bit of a waste. Obviously, if you're gonna be doing this, try to time it with an oil change so you don't have to waste your oil. New filter. I've changed the oil, I've driven the car, everything seems fine. Sea foam was burned out, as you saw it was smoking quite a bit on startup, but it is now fine. We are at 179,496 kilometers, 179,496. So over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna track the oil consumption and see how far we can go without having to top up the oil. Yeah, not very far. Um, as it turns out, phase one was complete waste of time. Um, sea foam did not have any positive effect on the oil consumption of this motor. The owner called me within four or five days. Yeah, lights back on at about 400 kilometers. So we've really done nothing to improve the oil consumption with seafoam. That aside, doing the seafoam soak actually helped me um, sort of think through the logistics of doing this on a V6 and, and sort of how to improve this, hopefully, this time around so we can be a little bit more effective. Now, I already talked about the angle of the pistons. Uh, the V is at 90 degrees here, so each piston is sitting about 45. In the first run, I was doing about 115 milliliters per cylinder per 12 hours. And I noted that the pistons that were at or close to top that center, the liquid was actually coming out of the cylinder bore and it was coming into the spark plug hole. So taking that a step further, obviously the solutions outside of the piston bore, it is soaking the entire piston crown and going around the entire piston. So that's definitely the result we're looking for here. And if we think about that even further, that also means that the solution is also soaking the bottom of the valves and the crown of the head where the valve sits. So that's actually not a bad thing. That's actually a very, very good thing because any crud, any carbon that's been built up around there, that includes the, the tips of the injectors as well from the inside. So this is actually a quite a good thing to do if we can somehow figure out how to do it on all six cylinders. What I've decided to do for the second phase here is to actually spread the timing a little bit, okay? On all the rest of them, I've done 24 hours, so all the pistons at the same time and, and, and call it a day. But here, what we're gonna do is I'm actually gonna split it in three sort of steps. I'm gonna do 24 hours per pair of pistons. So I'm gonna do two pistons for 24 hours, two pistons for 24 hours, two pistons for 24 hours. And that allows me to have the pistons that I'm soaking at top dead center at the same time, which means that I can reduce the amount of solution that I have to put in the cylinder and ensure that those two pistons are actually soaked in their entire surface at the same time. Now, as far as I can tell for the pairs, we've got cylinder one and six, we've got two and four, and we've got three and five that are at top dead center at the same time. Now I've already gone ahead and dumped two pairs of uh, cylinders here. I've done one and six, and I've done two and four off camera, just to kind of test everything out and make sure that uh, I'm not wasting your time. However, I hit a pretty significant problem after finishing the first pair, which only got worse as I got to the second pair. So let's go talk about that for a second because if you encounter the same thing and you're not paying attention, you may actually end up causing quite a bit of damage. Now we talked about how as part of the process, I turned the crank manually and the whole idea here is to, you know, get the liquid kind of moving around the, the piston rings and, and hopefully helping a little bit with the dissolvent on the carbon. So after I did the first pair of pistons and moved on to the second one, as I was turning the crank, I noticed a little bit of resistance kind of build up on one spot but I was able to just kind of, you know, push through it. it. wasn't a very big deal. I've now finished the soak on the second set of pistons and I went around to turn the crank again. And unfortunately I get stuck in a certain spot. So here we go. Crank's turning, crank's turning. And I get stopped right there. Now this isn't a compression thing. There's no spark plugs in the motor. Um, this isn't a situation where I can just push a little bit harder and it goes out. You can tell there's no, like this is not moving. This is not budging, I'm pressing pretty hard. Now, I was trying to figure out really how to do this. What if I hit it with the starter? But you know what? This right there is a very, very important lesson. Now we face the same thing when we do timing chains and timing belts on the motors. And the main rule when you do one of those is to always, always, always turn the crank by hand at least five, 10 times 
to make sure that everything's okay before you're going to hit the starter. Because the problem with starter is it does not know that something could have gone wrong. So if you have an issue, it's just going to plow right through it and it's going to cause significant amounts of damage. So once I've encountered this situation where I cannot turn the crank, we got to go investigate. All right, pause right there. I do have to apologize for just the horrible looking footage of inside the cylinders. Unfortunately, my endoscope failed literally right in the middle of this diagnostic, just as I was trying to figure out what's going on with cylinders one and six here. But that footage was already garbage to begin with. In any case, I'm using my Autel endoscope, which is a camera attached to a 2000 plus dollar car scanner. And it looks like this footage was shot in the 80s. Anyways, I'm truly sorry about the quality, but let's try and figure out actually what's going on. What you're seeing at the top here, and I cannot zoom in any better or get a better angle on this because it is unfortunately on the side of the piston and the camera is really going straight in. What you're seeing at the top of your screen here is a quite significant sized chunk of carbon that wasn't there on the piston when I started the process because I inspected all of the cylinders and that was not there. If I switch the camera over to the side angle, and unfortunately this camera doesn't have a side lens, so it's using this really weird mirror contraption to look at the side of the cylinder. But anyways, if I switch that over and even worse video footage, you can see this sort of dirt that's built up on the side of the, the cylinder wall where this carbon buildup is on the, on the piston. So as I'm pushing the piston out the top of the piston with this carbon buildup hits the bottom of the head and does not allow the piston to keep rotating. So very obviously we had uh, foreign matter inside the cylinder that I somehow had to evacuate. I panicked, to be honest with you, because this looked like it was quite a big chunk and didn't seem like I was going to be able to uh, break it apart. But as I was looking at the camera and my dad was turning the crank, you could see that this was actually kind of crumbling as the piston was coming up to the top. So it looked like it was more of uh, sort of like a dusty uh, carbon buildup. And I decided to try and blow it out with compressed air, at least to try. And if not, I was going to have to put some sort of other solution inside and try and break it apart somehow. I put a hose down into each individual cylinder, pressed it out, uh, and it blew out a ton of garbage straight out of the cylinder. Now, in retrospect, I should have probably done that with every single engine that I've done so far, because this would just simply blow any garbage that's sitting inside the cylinder rather than burning it inside when I put the plugs. So another lesson learned out of this process, um, whether your crank does stop or not, make sure you blow out any garbage you have inside of it before you start the engine. With all the carbon garbage blown out of the cylinders, I was actually able to rotate the crank and it started turning smoothly again. So I decided to go ahead and finish the process with cylinders three and five. So let's just go do that. Now you may recall early in the video, I was doing about hundred milliliters uh, of solution per cylinder. And for the cylinders that were closer to the top, that liquid went out of the cylinder bore and into the spark plug hole. For the ones that are at the bottom, it did not even coat the whole cylinder. So what I've actually done is I've experimented a little bit with the amounts. And now, as long as the cylinders you're treating at are at top dead center, we can actually go with half of the amount. So I'm gonna go down to about 50 milliliters per cylinder, which actually fills up the entire space on top of the piston at top dead center and gets more liquid into the spark plug hole. If you go with 100 in that particular scenario, liquid's actually gonna pour out. You're gonna have too much solution for the space that you've got. I'm sure I can do math on this and figure out exactly what the volume is on top of the piston, but it doesn't really matter. The point is at 50 milliliters, you get liquid coming and coating the entire piston. With that in mind, because you now have solution more or less outside of the cylinder bore, you can imagine that the solution is actually treating the bottom of the valves, all right, and the piston at the same time. Now, I've already done one and six. I've already done two and four while I was, you know, playing around and testing. So let's do uh, three and five and see if this is going to have any effect. Twelve hours in. Let's take a look. Let's put the probe down in and see what we're doing. Yeah, it looks very similar to 
what I was saying before, now we do have some liquid left. So not all of the liquid has gone down, but the carbon is very sticky looking. So the B12 has done a fairly decent job. What about cylinder five? Some liquid left at the side of the piston here, you can see it. But otherwise everything is very gummed up and gross. Let's turn the crank a few times, make sure everything is still running fine. And then we're gonna pour another 50 milliliters in those two cylinders. I'm right about at the end of the second can here, so I'm just gonna split it equally between the two. Twenty four hours after the last pair uh, has done soaking, I spent quite a bit of time cleaning all the cylinders with compressed air. I vacuumed any liquid that was left inside anywhere uh, on the pistons. I turned the crank by hand for a good 15 minutes just to make sure there's really no issues, there's no hiccups before I hit the starter on this. Frankly, the amount of garbage that keeps coming out of this motor is astonishing. I this is a very <laughs> This is a very, very dirty engine. I have no idea what caused it, how this came about. The owner uh, says that he's using 91 octane and I know he's using the right oil. So that's, it's, it's frightening to see an engine that dirty. This is a 2017, this is not even a, an old vehicle or anything like that. Yeah, okay, 180,000 kilometers. Anyways, I digress. Let's crank the motor now um, to try and clean up the cylinders as much as we can put the spark plugs back and start it. At this point, I've got about one liter of B12 in the oil. Frankly, if this was my motor, I'd probably run it pretty hard for a good half an hour, but it's not my motor. I already talked about this at the beginning of the video. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to run the motor with the B12 in it, but I'm just gonna let it idle for 15, 20 minutes, just kind of bring it up to temperature and I'm gonna stop it there. I'm not gonna put any stress on this engine with B12 in it. Let's wash everything on the inside. This is a very strong engine flush, if you will. The filter is new, it's only got about 800 kilometers on it um, and I'm changing it at the end of this process. So hopefully the filter will capture anything that's you know gone through into the oil pan before it hits the rest of the motor uh, coming out of the oil pump. I don't know what to tell you, I wanted to buy um, an S4, an A6 with a three liter supercharged motor. I've heard really good things about it, but seeing the inside of this engine is really making me question that sort of decision. Anyways, let's, let's crank it up, see what happens. brought the engine up to temperature. Let's take a quick sample of the oil. Although, considering what was inside the motor, and I'm not sure what I'm expecting here. I'll be honest with you, the oil does look okay. Trying to see if there's any grit, like I was seeing on the Q5. Can't really tell much. 
Yeah, you can, I mean, you can see some particles. But this oil has 800 kilometers on it, so I mean, this more or less brand new. Anyways, I'm not sure what I'm expecting to see here, but we gotta drain this because the B12 cannot run inside the engine for a long time. Well, the oil's draining. Let's have a quick chat about the oil. This engine takes 5W40, European synthetic, whatever. Lots of manufacturers make the same thing. Now, I did this on my A4, and because of the condition this motor, I'm actually gonna do this on this three liter supercharged as well. After the piston soak, I run Rotella T6 diesel oil for about a thousand kilometers or pretty much as long as you're comfortable with. This is synthetic oil. It's not approved for this engine. So there's your disclaimer, this oil is not approved for this motor. However, this is a heavy duty diesel oil, which comes with a lot of detergents already in it, more so than any other oil out there. Now, the owner of the car was able to find 5W40. I've run different weights before. If you can find this one, at least the weight is correct for the car. I wouldn't recommend running this for a long time. Um, I can't tell you if it's gonna damage anything or not. I, my personal feeling is that it's not, but this is not the approved oil for this engine. So, so I've agreed with the owner. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run this in the motor for the next thousand kilometers, see how the car behaves, see how the consumption is. And if everything looks good, if perhaps we eliminated consumption, we're gonna drain this out and just swap it out for Fuchs or liquid moly or whatever he's got that he wants to run in this motor. For now, right after the piston soak, we're gonna put this on and run it for a few hundred kilometers to see how it does. All right, let's do that again. The car's buttoned up. I drove it for a little bit. It still smokes a little bit until the B12 burns off. There's nothing we can do about it. Oil level is full and we are at 181,601. So I'm gonna give this back to the owner of the car and he's gonna keep me posted as to when the light comes on for the oil. Hopefully we can beat 400 kilometers. Guys, we did it again. This B12 stuff is pure magic. The owner just sent me a video. The Q7 is at 1200 kilometers, has not burned a drop of oil. This was incredible. Now, I'll be honest with you, I was a bit scared in the middle there when we did the seafoam soak and nothing happened. But as you saw, the amount of garbage that came out of the cylinders is just clear indication that B12 is the stronger solvent and you need to use that when you do your piston soak. In quick summary, the difference between doing this on the two liter turbo, which is a straight four, and a three liter supercharged, which is a V6, is that on the V6, the pistons are sitting at 45 degrees to the vertical, and you cannot soak the entire piston surface unless you put the pistons atop that center. That means that if you wanna do it 24 hours per piston, the process is gonna take a little bit longer. You're gonna to have to do three pairs of twos, but as you saw, with only 50 milliliter of B12 every 12 hours, or a total of 100 milliliters per cylinder, or a total of 600 milliliters per the engine, we were actually able to save this Q7 and save the owner thousands of dollars in repair bills. I'm now four for four on the vehicles. I've done two two liter turbos in my A4 and the Q5. I've done a VR6 with my two rig, and this is the V6 in the Q7 that we just completed. This works, okay? If your car is burning a lot of oil and you have stuck piston rings, get some B12, try some different chemicals if B12 is not available, although you can order it from eBay and a bunch of other stores and get your car back on the road. This stuff works. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see, click the thumbs up. If you wanna see more, click subscribe. And hopefully this process is gonna work for your car just as well as it's worked for every other one that I've personally done. All right, thanks for joining me. Have a good one.